it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Alaskan Curse. Remember, it always comes from the sea. Anak murmurs as we sit around the roaring fire, staring me right in the eyes and shaking her bony finger in my direction. In the far stretches of America, my family had only just arrived home from Cousin Panuk's funeral after a full day's travel, and Anak and I sit across from each other in front of the fireplace. Although this is one of the first funerals I've attended, I find it strange that there is neither a body nor burial during this service, and afterwards when meeting with my relatives here in the far north of Alaska for the first time in years, we are told that we are strictly forbidden from bringing up Cousin's name, even among each other. While we played, nobody, not even Cousin's siblings, talked about him during his life, let alone his death, and I was more confused than ever. On the eighteen-hour car ride home, Mother and Father sat in silence, but when we neared the outskirts of our city, I asked them what had happened to Cousin Panuk. Mother went pale and told me that I am never to bring Cousin's name up again, and that they will tell me what happened when I am older and ready. My grandmother, my Anak, as we call her, came to live with us in the city many years ago. I woke in the middle of the night shortly after we arrived home by the subtle knocking of Anak at my door. She brought me to the living room before making sure mother and father were asleep, sitting in her old rocking chair before pointing at the chair across from her and motioning for me to do the same. The Imakum Majuk always comes from the sea, Anak repeats, getting a stern look as she reaches out to grab my wrist. Her grasp on my arm isn't too uncomfortable, but I can feel the cold metal of a ring pressed against my skin. What's an Imak? Ku Majuk? I ask, puzzled. I don't know the Inuit language as well as the rest of my family, and I've never heard this word before. It is the reason your cousin is gone, she states, her grip around my wrist tightening. Well, I can do nothing but stare, wide-eyed. Oh, finally, it's time to get some answers around here, I think to myself. What happened to cousin? Um, this thing killed cousin Panu, I ask. She whispers, with a tone of fear in her voice. Your cousin's gone, but his body's still alive. What do you mean, Arnok? I question her once more. We went to his funeral yesterday. We went to his funeral to honor his life, but he is not dead. Your parents don't want you to know until you're older, so you'll take it seriously, but I think you're old enough to understand. Tell me what happened, I plead. I'm ready, I swear. Arnak slightly relaxes in her chair before continuing, taking nervous glances over her shoulder to make sure my parents are not coming down the hallway to scold us for being awake so late. She begins by telling me part of the history and tradition of our people, which I already know very well, but still patiently wait before she gets to the part that I want to hear. My parents told me about the Imak Mujak when I was just a girl not much younger than yourself, she said, and the mention of the Imakumajuk immediately got my attention fully. My sister and I were playing in our camp when we caught a whiff of the most awful stench that we ever encountered. A smell of rotting fish, garbage and stinking meat. Not a minute later there was a commotion in the camp. The men and women of my clan were running to and fro, desperately packing up what they could. This included my parents who quickly scooped up my sister and I to place on the sled. We hadn't even packed up all of our supplies before we took off, leaving untold amounts of precious meat and animal skins behind. I didn't see it for myself, but my father told me that... I thought your father died when you were young, Anna. I cut her off in my curiosity. Yes, little one, but this was before my father passed on, she informed me before trailing off. It took her a few seconds to regain her train of thought and continue where she'd left off. Now, where was I? Right. When we were safe in the sled, that's when Father informed us it was an Imakumachuk, and that the great spirits have blessed us in Nuuk with good sense of smell so that we may flee before it arrives. Her rough and twisted hands were beginning to hurt me now as I locked on and the pressure increased. What is it, Anak? 
What is it? I begged her to give me details. The Imakumajuk is a terrible creature, one I pray you may never see. You must understand those who still live the traditional life, such as Panuk and his family, never take the earth and its creatures for granted. Every single part of every single animal they come across is used for something up in those endless white plains. But when it comes to this, this thing, you don't hunt it or track it. You wouldn't dare. I thought back to when I was in school, that our homeland in the north had less people or animals than almost anywhere else in the world. And when we drove through the snowy hills with my parents that weekend and saw nothing but trees, ice and snow for hours and hours, well, I believed it. If they're not careful and do not take heed, entire camps, entire villages even, can be gone in just a day. What kind of creature can do this? I interrupted Arnak as I leaned forward to feel the warmth of the crackling fire. Not the beast itself, but those affected by its terrible curse, she continued. The Imakumajuk itself is a hulking thing, the size of two igloos put side by side with a shell as hard as stone and large spikes covering its body. This light blue color makes it almost impossible to see in the snow, so it always is best to recognize them by the smell instead. And one thing for certain is that it always emerges from the sea to hunt. No tribe has ever been able to kill it. I don't even think it can die. And the last thing most people see as the Imakumajuk charges at them is its dozens of black eyes staring them down its countless legs ferociously scuttling across the ice, and its spiny, jagged claws snapping and snapping. I mean, the last thing they see before the change, that is. Change? What happens to them? The ones that the Imakumajuk takes? Its touch is a curse, Anak trembled out. One touch is all it takes, and your mother... Your father, your child, anyone you care about will begin to forget that they even knew you at all. It's only an hour or so, sometimes less, before they start spitting and howling. Or oh, if you're unlucky enough to be near someone with the curse, they'll insist that they're fine. Try to walk on with you if you let them, but it's only a matter of time. You can tell they're fully gone by looking at their eyes. Black eyes that never blink and never stop staring at you. She dug her nails into my wrist and yanked my arm away. I know that it's an accident that she couldn't control her hands very well for the past few years. But Arnak was really frightening me now. I could tell she's nearing tears by the bright reflection coming off the bottom of her eyes. That's what happened to a man in my clan. He'd forgotten something very important at the camp and went back for it. Despite our pleas for him to keep moving with the rest of us. Uh, he was adamant about returning claiming that his ancestors would never forgive him for leaving behind his family heirloom. He came back several hours later, but he was changed. He spat out black chunks from his mouth. He scratched at his skin, leaving behind black and red marks on his face. Oh, but the worst part was his eyes. It started with small shadowy lines around the edges, but soon both of his eyes were nothing but darkness. When he staggered past my sister and I on the sled... He took off his glove and reached out a hand, dripping in black goo towards us. That's when my father and the other men of the clan knew that he needed to go. After telling this part of the story, Hana calmed down a bit and locked her ringed fingers together, moving them closer to the fire for the heat it provided. I thought you'd never seen Imakumajuk, I asked Anak. I have never seen it, child, but... I've seen those it's cursed with its murky liquid. Their speech becomes jumbled by this terrible affliction, and not soon after, restraining this man, my father was forced to gag the fellow to keep all his spitting and stuttering obscenities to a minimum. It had been many generations since our clan had an encounter with the Imakumachuk, but they still knew how to handle any who were cursed. Careful not to touch the cursed man himself, Father wrapped him in a large dried seal pelt before tackling him to the ground and binding the skin tightly with help from a few of the strongest men in the clan. They dragged the screaming and delusional man miles and miles through the snow, and although his mouth was covered, I could still hear every word coming from him. I heard him alternate between begging to be released 
begging for death and then threatening to kill every one of us, all within the span of half an hour, only for him to start all over and repeat that cycle again and again. Well, Anak, is this story really true? I butted into her story to make sure this isn't one of the village legends like the Kalupalik, made to scare children who don't listen to their parents. I wouldn't be telling it to you if it weren't, child. This isn't to scare you. I'm trying to save you. Then, is this what really happened to Cousin Panu? Arnak slowly closed her eyes and nodded her head before continuing, a small tear rolling down her cheek. The men of the village took that cursed man to a local lake that stayed frozen all year long, all the while he was squirming and wriggling about in that sealskin. My father took a hacksaw, like the ones your aunt and uncle used for cutting snow for the igloos, and cut a circle into the surface of the frozen lake, almost a foot down before hitting water. Arnak punctuated this sentence by pulling apart her hands to show me just how thick the ice was. It was difficult work, but eventually they were able to remove the circle of ice and plunge the cursed man into the dark, still water before picking up the ice block and covering the hole like a cork. That's why Panuk wasn't buried, I mumbled, finally figuring out why his funeral was so out of the ordinary. Once one is marked with the curse of the Imakumajuk, true death will always escape them. No matter what you do to their body, it will not stop trying to infect others, even if you put a bullet in their head. The only way to keep them from spreading is locking them underneath the ice, where they can no longer grow their pestilence. We didn't go ice fishing in these small lakes, and the surface was far too thick to crack, so it was perfectly safe for us to walk across its surface. But I'll never forget the faces of the cursed ones staring back at us through some of the thinner, clearer parts of the ice. It helps to remember that they are no longer people like us. The fire was beginning to die down now, and the light seemed to dance across Arnak's spotty, wrinkled face. I was starting to think that there were some truths that I would rather not know about. I've heard stories from other villages, though. She pressed on while pulling her hands from the dying fire and rubbing them against her arms. Stories of men snapped in half at the waist by the Imakumajuk's fearsome claws, only to keep dragging themselves through snow and ice, leaving the toxic, inky gunk wherever he tread. Others that are afflicted with the curse strip themselves of all their clothing before tearing at their skin and giving chase to their former family, doing anything in their power to spread the curse to all who are near. I can't be certain whether this is rumor or not, but another young boy in a neighboring tribe told me about the time his father came across a blackened head buried in the snow, only this head didn't have a body, or oh, its eyes darted around as quickly as any living souls would, and although nothing escaped from its mouth except black drool, it still opened and closed at a steady pace, chattering its teeth together and clicking its tongue on the roof of its mouth. Arnak fumbled with the rings on her fingers nervously, and looked at me before resuming. This is what happened to your cousin, she stated. Your cousin and his friends were walking near the water's edge on the beach when they smelled the stench, but they didn't take the warnings to heart. The boys were cursed by the Imakumajuk and ran back to their village to tell their parents. So, Panuk's out there somewhere, I nearly shouted in shock, underneath one of those frozen lakes. I told you, your cousin Panuk is gone. His body and mind are no longer his to control. I suppose, in a way though, part of him still exists in that shell of a body. I expect you not to bring up his name after tonight, ever again. We are never to speak the names of those afflicted with the curse of Imakumajuk after they are gone, lest someone remember them for how they were in life and attempt to release them from their resting place. We are only to acknowledge them just once and then move on, no matter how painful it... Just then... Anak was cut off by the creaking of a door down the hallway, and I nearly jumped as I saw Father step into the living room, where I could barely see his face in the dim light of the fire. I heard a clink of something falling against the wood floor as Anak quickly stood and addressed her son. Well, I think I'll be going off to bed now. 
Arnak told Father before grabbing a cane and gently hobbling down the hall. I hope you learned something from this story, child, she yelled after me while entering her room. Father merely stared at me with his arms crossed. I know I'm going to be punished for staying up past my bedtime and speaking of Panok, but I can only hope that Father doesn't find out we were talking about Panok and the Imakumachuk too. Father only stands there, one foot in front of the other, without a word escaping from his lips. Um, Anak was just telling me stories of her father when she lived in the north. I blurt out, hoping to end this silence. But at this, my father's eyebrow is instantly raised and he tilts his head. Oh, really? Tales of her father? The stern man says while slowly walking forward. And I begin to panic, knowing that he can always tell when I lie. Father walks past me, grabs another log and places it on the fire. And I know that I'm really in for it now. I'm certain that he plans to have a long conversation with me and scold me for listening to Arnold. After he has a seat, I break almost immediately, telling him some of the things Arnak told me about Panok, and the time her village was attacked by a monster before her father rescued her. Father only shakes his head and places a hand above his brow, before letting out a sigh and leaning forward. So, it's really not true then. The Imakumajuk really is just a story to scare me. Isn't it, Papa? But the mention of the Imakumajuk... Father's face becomes twisted in anger, and his eyes narrow. I think maybe I made a mistake, and that now both Arnak and Father will be angry with me. But his scowl quickly goes, and he instead tells me to continue. Tells me that he's not angry. He just wants to know what she told me. I recount the entire story Arnak told me of the Imakumajuk, careful not to leave out any details, and end by telling him that I was sorry and I won't ask about Panuk again. Once more, Father lets out a large huff of air before continuing. Arnak's story is wrong, son, he explains to me in a sad, shaky voice. Oh, so, Panak wasn't really cursed by the Imakumajuk, I let out, but I'm very confused at this point. No, he was, and the Imakumajuk is real, but... He takes a pause before continuing. Look... Your Arnak doesn't always tell the truth, okay? Sometimes, because she's so old, she mixes things up. Or maybe she just believes what she wants to believe. But it wasn't a strange man from her clan that they buried in the ice that day. My eyes finally drift down and I glance towards where I heard the metallic clink from earlier when Arnak sat up. I get out of my chair and lean down to inspect the object before picking it up. The same metal ring that was pressed against my skin while Arnak was holding on to me. Father reaches his hand out for me to give it to him, and I drop it into his palm. You're not in trouble, Father says to me while standing up and pointing at my room. Why don't you go to bed now, son? I have to return this to the family chest where it belongs. Howl's at dawn. Aramba woke Dawn from her evening nap. She jumped from her bed to see everything in her room sway. As she hurried out of her bedroom, her brothers bolted past her. They went to the kitchen and all was still shaking. She grabbed her little brother, Thomas, and they hid under the kitchen table. A few plates fell and shattered overhead, and then the rattle stopped. She checked on Mary, the baby of the family, and saw she had a slight bruise from where a book had fallen and hit her but nothing too serious. Mary wailed, and Dawn picked her up from her crib and bounced her on her hip. Her hands trembled as she slowly opened the door. A water main had cracked and was pouring into the street where the road had completely buckled. It had looked as though the hand of God had come down and folded the street in half. The earthquake had spared the trailer where her family lived from the damage. Inside, there were a few broken dishes and picture frames, but nothing too great. It had crumpled the houses on the neighbouring street to the ground, and giant cracks were in the road. Tom, I need you to watch Mary. I'm going to go over to the shop and make sure Mum and Dad are safe. It's too dangerous for you to travel alone, he said. I need to know that they're okay, she said while handing off the toddler to her ten-year-old brother. I'll be back as soon as I can. And with that, she snatched some sandwiches her mum had made for lunch from the refrigerator, 
and lay them in a basket. She gripped a large nickel-plated flashlight, put on a heavy red coat, and dashed out the door. The air was icy, and the ground still had a healthy amount of snow, but it was thawing in the March air. It was already dark at 6pm, but that's how Alaska was. It was where Dawn lived, and she would not have traded it for anything, well, except for today. All the beauty had folded in half. Trees jutted out of the road, and rubble lay everywhere. She turned on her flashlight to better see in the dark and rushed towards downtown Anchorage to the repair shop her parents ran. Stopping to catch her breath, her flashlight caught glowing eyes. A giant brindle wolf jumped out in front of her, knocking the basket out of her hands. The wolf went over to the sandwiches and devoured them. When Dawn ran to reach for a basket, the wolf snapped at her and continued eating. There was a gunshot overhead, and the wolf ran off in the other direction. Another shot fired. Please, stop. It was probably just hungry, screamed Dawn. Oh, the wolf looked like it was attacking you, said a man's voice in a slow drawl. No, it just wanted my sandwiches. Well, so much for lunch, sighed Dawn as she picked up the basket. Sir, I have to go downtown. I have to make sure my parents are okay. Why are you going alone? he asked. My folks run a repair shop downtown. My brother's at home with my baby sister. We're all right, but looks like the phone lines are down. Well, all correct, but why don't I go with you? The earthquakes made the roads dangerous, and up here you're not on top of the food chain, he replied, nodding in the wolf's direction. Dawn nodded as she picked up her basket. She saw that the man was skinny with an enormous hat and thick glasses. They both walked over the craggy streets together. My name's Hanson. Robert Hanson, he said, holding out his hand. Dawn Michaels, she said, giving his hand a firm shake. Oh, that's some coat you have on. Oh, my folks got it for me at J.C. Penney's for my birthday. I turned 13 a month ago. Is that so? Dawn nodded and hurried up ahead, but the street had shattered, leaving a massive sinkhole. What do I do now? sobbed Dawn. I know a way, he said, nodding his head past the rubble. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. He grabbed her hand firmly and pulled away from the road, towards the deep pine forest. Are you sure you recognize the way, sir? asked Dawn. Yeah, of course I do. Well, are you sure the woodlands are the best course? I mean, as you said, we're not on top of the food chain. There may be bears, wolves, or angry moose out that way. Dawn followed Mr. Hansen into the woods as the ground rumbled once more, knocking them both to their knees. Soil tumbled down the steep ravine. Robert got to his feet and helped Dawn up. He led her down a path into the forest. Debris lay everywhere. It had ripped trees from their roots, and rocks jutted out like angry teeth. Sir, I don't think it's wise to go this way, said Dawn. Dawn no longer felt safe with Mr. Hansen, and headed out of the woods. He grabbed her sharply by the arm and pulled her close to him. You're going to have to trust me. No, she replied, as she struggled to break free. You're not on top of the food chain, little girl. I am, he added as he pointed the gun at her. His body pressed against her, and she felt cold steel from a knife tip on her neck. She wanted to scream for help, but she was so far into the wilderness that no one would hear her. She knew she should have listened to her brother. It was too dangerous to go alone with the wild animals and aftershocks. But she never thought a person would hurt her. I mean, people were here to help. When the nights got cold and dark, they were there to be beside you and keep you warm. Well, now she would never feel warm again. Tears fell from her eyes, and out of nowhere, she heard a low growl. Looking up, she saw the brindle wolf from earlier, only now it had its packmates. And they'd surrounded Mr. Hansen. He aimed and shot at one of them, but the bullet flew wild. Dawn struck him in the head with her flashlight, and he fell unconscious. The brindle wolf licked Dawn on the hand and watched her. Its eyes were a beautiful warm gold. Dawn saw that the wolf was female and appeared as though she might have been nursing. Thank you, Mrs. Wolf, she said, 
dusting herself off. The wolf seemed to nod, and then trotted off into the forest after her pack. Dawn headed back to the road, and a large army truck greeted her. A gruff older man piled her into the rig. Look, they've called martial law on the city of Anchorage. Tsunamis have struck coastal towns like Kodiak, and landslides are wreaking total devastation. I need to see my parents, said Dawn. She gave the address of their store to the gruff man in the truck. Driving downtown, she saw it had devastated everything. J.C. Penney's had all but sunk under asphalt. It had ripped roads in half, and gas and water lines were burst, pouring everywhere. They stopped outside the repair shop. It was crumpled to the ground, but her mother and father stood. She saw that her dad had a large goose egg on his head, but her mom looked uninjured. Dawn embraced them, and the army truck took them to the hospital for examination. Her father only suffered a mild concussion, and her mom was fine. The cab dropped them off at their trailer. Rushing in, they hugged Thomas and Mary, relieved that their house and children were well. I'm glad you went looking for us, but, but never do something that stupid again, sighed her mother. I'd rather have you home safe. Something could have happened. Dawn nodded. She was about to tell her about the man when she heard a howl outside. She looked out the window and saw the brindle wall. It's all right, Mama. I gave her some sandwiches, and she's just been following me. You know, if you feed them, you'll never get rid of them, her dad said, raising an eyebrow. That's okay. The earthquake scared her. The wolf wagged her tail, and she could see the smaller eyes of four pups looking at her. The mama wolf then gathered her young and headed off into the woods. I think she just wanted to say goodbye. I'll just be vigilant. They're dangerous animals, her dad said. Yeah, Papa, but man is the most fatal. Yeah, I suppose you're right, Dawn. You be careful of who you trust. At least most of God's creatures are pure in their intention. Dawn nodded at this, and overhead the northern light shimmered, and she heard howls in the distance as she settled down for bed. Anchorage eventually got back on its feet after the earthquake. Her parents finally had their shop again, and all was well. She never saw Mrs. Wolf again, but would occasionally hear howls in the night that comforted her. They arrested Robert Hansen and charged him with killing over 17 women. She felt lucky that she'd survived. All by the luck of a furry guardian angel. It wasn't a reindeer. Christ, I muttered to myself as the first flakes of snow started to fall. They gathered in fuzzy clumps over the windshield before my wipers cleared them away. I'd been waiting for 15, no, 20 minutes now in my sister's driveway. Had I chosen to wait inside with her, I'd have been dead by now from her two grey cats. Cute little devils, but a murder to my sinuses. Puffy eyes and a clogged up throat. Yeah, that's just what I needed. Every Christmas our family made the annual trip to my grandparents' cabin tucked away in the woods of Hope, Alaska, and I'd hoped to beat the heavy snowfall that was forecasted. Since my sister's license was suspended from a DUI, here I was, a hostage to time, with my finger tapping anxiously on the steering wheel. When my mother had asked me to be the one to grab my sister, I'd honestly dreaded it from the start. It wasn't that we hated one another, we just weren't as close anymore. After decades of constant arguments and bitter disagreements, our relationship was distant and fizzled. Yes, we were siblings, but it felt more accurate to call us the residue of what siblings once were. Finally, like the gates of Valhalla, her front door opened and out she came. Her hair was forest green. <laughs> the last time I'd seen her, it had been white. The time before that, it was violet. Got everything? I asked as she clambered her way into the passenger seat. Hmm, she responded. And she adjusted her glasses and stuffed a few bags in the back seat. And just like that, we were off. Hope was about a thirty-minute drive, and it didn't take long for the awkward silence to inflate between us. It didn't help that the radio didn't work in my car, and that the broken auxiliary port made your music sound like it was having a seizure. By the time we reached the turn-off for Hope Highway, the road was turning into a thick white sheet. Thankfully, Christmas Eve night, 
The long stretch to Hope's small community was quick and vacant. The cabin was tucked away in a fortress of trees five miles off the main road. As I made the turn, my sister cracked the window, pulling out a blunt and lit it with a lighter. Want a hit? she asked. Snow crunched beneath us. Not while I'm driving. Oh, it's a straight path. We're practically there already. She took a drag and blew it out the window. Oh, I just want to focus on this, all right? She huffed and pushed up her glasses. Well, if you're that worried, maybe slow down a bit then. There was the jab. A piece of bait to lure me into another fight. But I wasn't going to bite. Not this time. She could live with us getting there faster. Well, the drive was almost over. I'd soon be in a warm living room with my feet up and a spiked eggnog in my hand. Bobby Helms, Jingle Bell Rock in the air. I could already hear Uncle Jed spouting off one of his crude jokes. Hey, why does Santa Claus have such a big... Dude, my sister shrieked, jabbing a finger in my side and whipping my mind back to the windshield. And the car had just finished winding around the thick trail. The large body of a reindeer stood in our path. Eyes wide open and blank. It didn't move as the high beams found it. Snapped into a panic, I twisted the wheels in a desperate swerve. The car veered greasily to the side in a fine spray of slosh. The reindeer, also known as a caribou, remained still even as the bumper soared inches from its nose. We came to a crunching halt off the main path. Jeez, I sighed, blessed with relief. Did we hit it? No, my sister said, leaning out the window while exhaling another plume of smoke. I wound the steering wheel back around and pressed on the gas. The wheel shrilled in place, kicking up globs of sleep but not moving an inch. Oh, perfect, I moaned and unfolded myself from the seat to check it out. The two front tires were caked in black slush and practically swallowed in a mound of snow. And I kicked at it, trying to clear off the icy debris from the treads and beneath the wheel well. When that tired me out, I resorted to scraping it off with my fingers. Ah, screw off, Prancer, I heard my sister call toward the dark silhouette of the reindeer, its antlers like gnarled fingers reaching for the treetops. Then she made a sort of startled yip, followed by a, what the fuck? I looked up from the scrim of snow. The reindeer was now standing tall on both of its hind legs. It looked strange, like a silly caricature you'd see in a kid's book. But out there, in the silence of the woods, it was a creepy image. The way its vague shape stood on just two legs held an almost human-like balance. For whatever reason, I realized then it didn't have a tail. Its muscular neck craned to the side, and let out an ululating scream, a miserable squeal of metal grinding against metal. My legs were ice sculptures, cementing me to the spot as the shriek quieted to a succession of wet grunts. The reindeer dropped down to its original posture and stomped heavily. Puffs of white vapour and strings of snot vented from its nostrils. Oh, I was no hunter, it didn't take a lot to tell me when a pissed-off animal was about to charge. I leapt for the driver's seat, pulled the door open, and slammed it shut just as the muffled thud of hooves reached me. Antlers scraped the door as its large body practically flew over the patch I'd just been standing in. Fast. Very fast. My sister screamed as the large bulk of its frame wound back around and charged again, this time shattering the headlights and submerging us in the darkness. Just go already, my sister hollered in my ear. I'm trying, goddammit, I hissed. The wheels still helplessly spun. We were trapped. The creature charged again, this time nailing the window and blew me a cobweb of cracks near my sister's head. I searched for anything, literally anything that I could use as a weapon. I was never really a gun enthusiast, but at that moment I'd have shaved my head and joined the secular monks if it meant having a Glock in my hand right then and there. After rattling the car once more, the reindeer finally appeared to lose interest and disappeared between the cluster of trees. 
granted some time to breathe and think, we phoned our dad and told him about the situation. He was going to come down in his pickup and get us unstuck and out of this mess. I looked over at my sister, who was taking long, steady breaths between her fingers. Are you all right? I asked. What do you think? She grumbled. I told you to slow down. Another jab. And this time I wasn't going to have it. Want to be useful? I yelled. Well, get out there and push. No. Well, shut the hell up. I don't need this right now. She said nothing else. And neither did I. Returning once again to the pocket of silence that our relationship had succumbed to. Oh, the sooner Dad's headlights peaked in the distance, the better. Suddenly... She rolled the window down. What are you doing? I asked. Shh. She pursed her lips. Just listen. Humoring her, I waited. And sure enough, the sound reached me too. The quiet voice of a little girl coming from outside. Somebody, it whimpered. I'm lost. Please help me. I'm lost. My sister unlocked the door and motioned to open it. I grabbed her wrist. What are you doing? She snapped. There's someone out there. Just wait a second. It's weird, isn't it? The voice continued to whine, choking between sobs and pleading for someone, anyone to help her. Well, I didn't like the way it sounded. The same lasting drawl between words. The same weeping sounds, like Someone was hitting repeat on a speaker. Something wasn't right, and my instincts were hoisting red flags left and right. And then my sister looked at me, and her expression warped into shock. She flung back, pinning both her shoulders against the interior. Things that sounded like words bubbled up, but didn't quite make it out of her throat. I turned and saw what was looking at me. It had the face of a man. Surrounded by the mottled fur of a caribou's body. The skin was a mummified brown color, wound tightly around its long skull like old, crinkled leather. Snowflakes landed against its wide, expressionless eyes and melted into the dark membrane of its pupils. It circled the car, bobbing its antlers and fogging up the windows as it peered inside. My heart shook the walls of my throat. I locked eyes with my sister, unable to say anything behind the sheer disbelief. I should have grabbed my phone, snapped a photo, recorded a video, anything. But my thoughts were jangled. It then let out that same horrible scream. But I didn't see its tight, contorted lips open. The sound was coming from its neck. Small, fleshy orifices... Flapping open like mouths were converted the high-pitched shrill into the mimic cry of a little girl. Help me. I'm lost. Help me. Headlights glazed the area. My father's pickup came into view, paving its way down the path. The reindeer, or whatever the hell it was, ran off, vanishing once again into the snow-covered thicket. Ugh. Nobody believed us. Why would they? If anybody had told me that story, I would have assumed they were hopped up on some crazy psychedelic. But the reality of what I saw was cold, and it's something I still, to this day, can't fully swallow. Instead of sleeping that night, my sister and I did some research that led us to the myth of skinwalkers. Beings of some sort able to mimic voices and disguise themselves as animals to lure people into the woods. After reading other accounts... There wasn't a doubt in my mind what we had witnessed out there. Every so often that night, I'd stare out the window and eye the yard, wondering if I'd see that leathery face watching from the tree line. Neither I nor my sister ever made that trip again, much to the frustration of my family. But there was a silver lining. She and I have never been closer. Beware the Alaskan flesh-eating fungus. My wife and I travelled overseas to a relative's cabin, out here in the middle of Alaska, of all places. <laughs> Reconciliation, she called it. A cheating whore, I would often reply. 
Yes, we'd come out here as some sort of therapy, so that I wouldn't call for a divorce, and let her entire family know that the last round of shots at every bar in town was most likely going to be on her, literally. So, let's get started with the cliches. Piss poor connection, so that I have to manage social interactions with her. Check. Absolutely no way of contacting anyone for help thus making it easier for me to cause some sort of fatal incident if I do get even more sick of her. <laughs> Check. Snow so deep that even a snowplow would struggle to clear the path to us. Check. Yes, I was prepared for an absolutely amazing time in the cabin we had. The interior seemed much more welcoming, though. Oak wood beams hanging from the ceiling. Arch doorways between the rooms. Great bay windows overlooking the vast canvas outside. Had it not been so damn cold, I might have considered staying here for a while longer. The first thing I can recall my wife doing was heading upstairs to find our bedroom. I promptly followed when my inspection was halted by her terrified cries. I paced up the stairs quickly, suddenly finding myself in a corridor surrounded by closed doors on all sides. Honey? I called out, questioning the worry I felt. In here! Hurry! I heard her call before seeing a beckoning hand reach out from one of the doors that had actually been slightly ajar. I jogged down the hallway to where my wife stood in the embrace of darkness peering just beyond the veil of sight. I tried to squeeze past her when she halted me from opening the door any further. What is it? I impatiently asked. What the hell is that? She muttered the words, but I could feel the scream she was holding back. I tried to peer into the darkness, but my eyes adjusted slowly. Then... A form. It was hard to discern from the other silhouettes in the room, but the harder I stared, the more I could pick out the details of it. I could make out protrusions here and there, and a solid form the size of a curled up adult person. I wasn't sure why my wife had screamed until the form began to writhe. In the darkness it swirled shifting the absence of light around it to form darker shadows that mocked the frailty of what I could perceive. At some point, I must have jumped backwards, because before I knew it, my wife and I had fallen out of the room onto our backs, still staring in at the darkness. But now, there wasn't any darkness. In the fleeting panic, the door had been thrown open, and the light from the hallway spilled into the room, Revealing the thing at the other side that was no longer sheltered by blackness. Shifting, ashen flesh, pulsated with purple veins. The form writhed uncontrollably now, and I could see something squirming within the grey skin. The protrusions appeared to be animal legs, like those of a deer. They were straightened out, stiffly shaking as the light set upon more of this thing. I gagged as the sack of grey began to violently shake, trembling so hard that it was beginning to hit one of the limbs against the wooden floor, emitting a thudding noise that split the air. I turned to see my wife gagging, and when I turned back to look upon the thing, I saw the veins grow large and throb so greatly that I should have expected the outcome. It exploded. No guts, no gore. Just a heavy cloud of thick dust erupting from it. I coughed as the dust cloud spread to us, dissipating as it met with the hallway light. I quickly rubbed my eyes free of whatever had gotten on my face, and looked to see the flesh thing deflated against the back wall. The legs wilted, 
and though I'd sworn to myself something had been inside, it had deflated entirely into a near puddle of something soot-like. What just happened? My wife screamed from beside me, coughing as she lifted herself from the ground. I gazed up at her in confusion, watching her wipe away some of the grey that had settled on her face. How the hell am I supposed to know? I replied, slapping my hands down and standing myself up beside her. She began to sputter, holding her hand over her mouth, only yielded more of the dust substance let out by the thing in the dark room. <sighs> Go get yourself into bed. I'll fix us up something to drink, I said with a growing resentment. Here I was, supposed to be having some sort of therapy session, and I was already catering to her like usual. But as much anger as I felt, I had a strange fear in me that whatever the hell was in that room was not right. Beside the boiling kettle, I held my phone up high for some semblance of signal. As that desired bar appeared on my phone, I reached up with my other hand to type in a description of what I'd seen. Nothing. No results relating to what I'd seen. But plenty of those horrid cyst-popping videos that somehow get around. As the kettle stopped boiling, I leaned over it to pour the water into the mugs on the side. But as I did, I felt something rise up in my throat and coughed violently. Sticky patches of grey splattered across the counter, some landing in the boiling water I'd accidentally spilled, and shriveling up into tiny black clumps. Jeez, what the fuck? I whispered to myself, before being interrupted by the louder coughing of my wife. It sounded as though she was trying to throw up her lungs, and when she finally stopped I could just barely hear the frail whimpers of agony she was managing. I looked once again to the boiling water on the side that had burned away the grey stuff and poured water into the mugs without mixing the tea before running with them upstairs. Here, drink this, I shouted at her, rushing to her side and sitting her up. She glanced cautiously at the steam rising from the mug, but she had quickly become pale and I saw no room for hesitation before I forced the water to her lips. She screamed, but she managed to gulp it down, coughing up some blood as the empty cup fell beside her. I held her as the tears rolled, and a charcoal sludge leaked from her lips. She tried to reach out for me, but I had already begun rushing back downstairs to get some cold water. That's when I saw black stuff on the kitchen side growing out along where I'd spilled the water. It was throbbing like the grey thing, only it was much faster, and let out a putrid stench as I neared it. Shit. 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 I groaned, paralysed. Then I heard the retching. I looked back to the stairs and tried to force myself to move but I couldn't. I coughed harder, and it wasn't until I'd stopped that I realized my wife had gone silent. My legs were finally able to move, and I sprinted back up the stairs and down the long corridor to the bedroom, where my wife lay motionless, splayed across the bed with her eyes blank, and her mouth agape, dripping with sludge. No, not dripping. The sludge was moving in such a way that it was travelling up, as though crawling back inside her. I ran as fast as I could out of the cabin. Throwing my knees against the heavy onset of snow was like trying to escape waves in an ocean. As I neared the car we had driven up in, my feet became numb and I fell into the snow. I remember the cold seeping into my skin, nipping at me as I felt a sharp tug against my ankle, 
before being dragged back into the house. I barely managed to turn around to see the ghostly face of my wife, her mouth oozing with the black stuff as she pulled me back up the stairs. I tried to scream, but I coughed, and when I tried to claw myself away, I felt once tender fingers rip into me. Did she bite me too? I struggled against the pain too much to know, but when I finally felt free, I tried to climb back to my feet, but they wouldn't move. I peered down to see my wife, molding us together into some sort of cocoon. I was granted the freedom of my arms, and up here there's reception, so I can tell anyone out there do not come to this cabin. I'm not sure how long I'll have left after this post. I can feel my legs liquefying in the cocoon. I can feel the thing growing inside of me, though not as quickly as it did her. And I can see my skin turning a bitter grey as the days grow endless and the hallway light starts to flicker. So yeah, Alaska, the Great White North. Um, an air of normality about it, because, well, it's part of the United States, but also an air of mystery, because, well, you know, who knows what's gone up there. What exists, what mysteries there are to be uncovered. Yep. That one's a special one to uh, my good friend Garrett. Uh, we started out together in Istanbul teaching way too long ago. Um, wasn't born in Alaska, but spent a lot of time there, so uh, never got a chance to go, but, well, who knows? Life is full of surprises, maybe one day. So, hope you enjoyed that little collection of stories. And, well, where are we? Wednesday already. Oh, the time is going by so quickly. First episode of the podcast coming out tomorrow. Now, this is the rehash a collection of stories i've done here on the channel before but um renewed for the halloween special hope you enjoy it please tune in uh, download if you can if you want to of course more to come well enough for me for one evening but i'll be back again very very soon till next time very very sweet dream some bye bye thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.